In Canada's early day, voting was considered a privilege, not a right. Affluent men could vote. Women who owned property could vote. Most didn't. After Confederation in 1867, all women were excluded. It was the law. May it be proclaimed and decreed that no woman shall have the right to vote at any election. In the 1880s and 90s, many saw women's suffrage contrary to biblical teachings. A member in the Ontario legislature attacked a proposed suffrage measure. The man was not made for the woman, but the woman for the man. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. He quoted scripture in a speech delivered to the Ontario legislature in 1893. A woman's place was in submission to man. Every year between 1905 and 1916, a bill to give women the vote was introduced in the Ontario legislature. It was greeted with laughter and scorn. The Premier of Ontario, James Whitney, in 1911 said, women's suffrage is a matter of evolution, and evolution is only a working out of God's laws. For this reason, we must not attempt to hurry it on. But the women's suffrage movement was well underway and growing. The prairies were a hotbed for such activity. One of the women who led the movement was Nellie McClung. As a popular author, she wrote about and celebrated Canada's rural west. She was middle class, a teacher, and a temperance leader. January 1914, McClung met with the Conservative Premier of Manitoba, Rodman Roblin, to demand women's suffrage. Roblin said it would break up the home and throw children into the arms of servant girls. The majority of women, he said, are emotional, and if given the franchise, would be a menace rather than an aid. McClung responded by staging a satirical play to a sold-out audience. The roles of men and women were reversed. The press loved it. Its success consolidated support for the women's cause. Overnight, suffrage had become mainstream. 1915, Manitoba, an overwhelming win for the Liberals. A year later, legislation giving women the same voting rights as men was passed. It was greeted with tremendous enthusiasm. Manitoba women were the first to vote. In that same year, the other prairie provinces followed. Women get the vote in Saskatchewan and Alberta. McClung had once told Alberta legislators that women's suffrage was in the tide. It now seemed to be sweeping across the country. The following year, in 1917, the suffrage movement triumphs in Ontario and British Columbia. Women could now vote in five provincial elections, but they were excluded from voting in federal elections. Pressure for change at the federal level was mounting, but a much more pressing political issue faced the government at the time, conscription. The Great War had dragged on for three years. Canadian losses at the front were incomprehensible, with casualties on a scale never seen before. Soldiers and politicians soon realized there would be no quick end, and men stopped volunteering. For Conservative Prime Minister Robert Borden, there was only one solution. And on August 29, 1917, the Military Service Act became law. It allowed Borden to conscript men across the country. It caused controversy. With an election looming, Borden was determined to win. Two new laws were introduced, both a transparent effort to increase the number of electors who would vote for Borden's government. These laws inadvertently benefited women. The vote was given to serving military personnel, otherwise not qualified. This included military nurses. 
they became the first Canadian women to get the federal vote. Female citizens over the age of 21 who were the wife, widow, mother, sister, or daughter of someone serving in uniform were also given the vote. Not all women were included. Women's contribution to the war effort was essential. R.B. Bennett, a young conservative member of parliament from Calgary, remarked that though he had not been favorably disposed toward votes for women in pre-war years, women's heroic exertions in the national crisis had won him completely to their cause. Why shouldn't we have a vote when women at the polls told a reporter? Haven't we got our husbands and sons at the front? The paper reported, most women assisted the boys at the front in a very tangible way by casting a vote for Borden's government. December 17, 1917, Borden is re-elected. In his victory speech, he thanks women's wonderful devotion. Three months later, his government introduces a bill to provide the vote for all women, uniform suffrage for women across Canada. The provinces would only determine the qualifications for men. When paper reported the proposed bill was eminently fair and just, and that Borden, though a late recruit to the suffrage cause, was an out-and-out -out one. The bill was not welcomed by all. In the House of Commons, Quebec Liberals attacked the bill. I say the Holy Scripture, theology, feminine psychology all seem to indicate that the place of women in this world is not amid the strife of the political arena, but in her home, said one member of parliament from Quebec. To keep up the birth rate of Canada, we must keep our women within their sphere, said another. Borden compromised. He amended his own bill. Women electors would have to meet the same requirements as men in the provinces where they live. On May 24, 1918, the bill received royal assent. The Dominion Elections Act of 1920 brought further advancements. Women over the age of 21 could vote in federal elections, regardless whether they had the right to vote in provincial elections. Not all women were included. Immigrants of Asian origin and their descendants, certain religious groups, Inuit and Aboriginal peoples were excluded. It was a struggle, never a fight, wrote Canada's first female senator. It wasn't until 1960 that the simple act of voting, once a privilege, finally became a right for all women.